All right, we are live. Happy Friday, everybody. Today is May 9th, and you're hanging out with my community manager, the community built by, for, and managed by community managers. Uh, as always, you can chat along with us on our Twitter chat over at hashtag CMGR Hangout, where I know some of you are watching right now, so hi, everybody, over on Twitter. Um, if you love what you're seeing today and have a great idea for a topic, um, you or you want to just be on the show, um, please go to our website at mycmgr.com. We have a button that says participate. Click that, fill out the form, and we'll get back to you. And it's uh, your ideas that kind of keep everything rolling and awesome every week. So um, nothing ties uh, community together quite like being together in the same place. Uh, and if you've ever planned an event, though, you know it's a ton of work. So today we're going to be answering questions like, hey, where do you get started? Um, where do you find a location? How do you get the word out? What's the best approach to find sponsors? And so on. Um, all the community managers that we have here today have been there, done that. Um, and so I'm sure we're going to get lots of great advice. Um, so as always, we love to introduce uh, ourselves, uh, starting with Sherry. Hey everyone, I'm Sherry Brody and I lead community and user experience at a company called Rebellion Media as well as produce CMGR Hangout here with Brew. Um, and I'm actually heading out in a couple hours here to some community events over in Europe, so pretty excited. Awesome. Well, that Definitely, thanks for taking the time, Sherry, to still keep the train running here as you're about to go overseas. That's pretty cool. Yeah, thanks for fitting us in, Sherry. <laughs> We're very happy for you. I'm very jealous, actually. So I'm Shannon, and I run Canada's largest social media blogging and PR conference called Blistem Canada. And we're in our fifth year, and we're meeting in Mississauga this year from October the 2nd to the 4th. Awesome, and thank you, Shannon, for taking time uh, to spend with us today. And Jennifer, how are you? Good. Um, <clears throat> Hey everybody, my name is Jen Shah. I'm uh, New York City based. I'm the founder of New York Tech Women, which is uh, one of the most uh, active and largest community groups for women in technology, specifically the kind of technology and startup scenes here in New York City. I um, happen to be a founder of New York Tech, of uh, Bella Minds as well, which is a platform for tech education all across the country. So my life is pretty much events. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like uh, lots of events all the time, so great. And uh, Eliza, how are you? Hi, I am well. I'm joining you all here from Vancouver. Uh, so I'm the Community Events Coordinator for Hootsuite, uh, which entails a lot of stuff, sponsorships, running the Hoot Up program, um, and lots of fun. Cool. Well, thanks for joining us. We love uh, when the Hootsuite people can share their wisdom, so thanks. You're welcome. And April, how are you? Hi everybody, I am April and I am coming from San Francisco. I am the developer community manager at salesforce.com and I also am one of the co-organizers of the San Francisco NetSquared chapter. Cool, awesome. All right, well, um, feel free to just jump right in um, as, as we um, talk about these different questions. Um, and the first one is, how far in advance do you start planning an event? Um, and I, I'm guessing there's probably a range of uh, answers here, right? Well, for us, we're in our fifth year. So uh, we tend to, actually, we're actually already planning for Blistin Canada 2015. But for brand new events starting out, you're looking probably about six months to a year to kind of get things going. Wow. So I can't just have an event, like, next week? <laughs> well, you can. Smaller version. We're, we're dealing with 400 to 500 people all under one roof. And so there's a lot of different uh, different things you need to make sure that are all aligned. But for smaller events, absolutely, we do a lot of tweet ups. So we'll actually we're we're heading across Canada right now. We're planning for hitting uh, Vancouver, Montreal, Ottawa, Edmonton, Winnipeg, Halifax. And so those uh, don't take as much effort as the massive conference on its own. Um. Yeah, we could do an event next week if you want. <laughs> um, I actually, um, I have, I'm, I'm kind of like Shannon. Um, I try to have a full calendar of events um, for the next um, for the next year. Our events specifically are smaller, so they're the ex um, the exact 
the exact opposite of like 400 big 400 person conferences. We do our small events are anywhere between um, 10 to 40 people, um, and they're distinctly curated um, to create sort of a different vibe and communication. So we plan um, very consistent events for the entire year, um, and uh, and then we sort of fit workshops and other small things sort of in between. Um, kind of as we see, as we're approached, or as we see a need. Yeah, I mean, my work with Net Squared in particular, you know, you're talking about a, a local community meetup, so a lot of times your events are based on just what speakers available and when. Um, so sometimes we have, you know, had to just do it the very next week because that was all that was available. Um, other times we've had larger speakers, and so we've had a few months prep time um, for larger corporate events, you usually, you know, uh, you know, have have a few more uh, people helping you, and <laughs> to have some more time headed up. But it's a little bit of everything, and you know, some people are able to put together a really amazing event in just a couple of weeks. I think um, it's in when you start considering how far in advance you do need. The big thing is how much time do you really need to get the word out about it? Uh, for most people, they're going to need at least two weeks to either rearrange their schedule or have that open, that slot open that you can then book them up with. Yeah, and just, and just to add to that, um, I think also you have to keep in mind, for Hootsuite, we do a lot of global events. So there's a lot of like cultural considerations in terms of you know people in Latin America may may not register until last minute, whereas people in Europe may be way more on top of it. And then registration rates as well, like people are more likely to to go if they actually register or or they just drop in. Um, but yeah, in general, for for events that we have here at, at Vancouver and in, in our HQ, uh, we do like generally a month. We'd like to send the registration out at, um, at least a month before the event. Um, but yeah, it really just varies what type of event it is, right? Awesome. And uh, David, I see um, you have joined us, so that's great. Can you uh, just say hi to everybody? Hello. And then we're on the we're on the question: How far in advance do you start planning an event? Um, yeah, thanks for having Omaha right now in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, a big entrepreneur conference, so I just hopped into a room. Um, I'm David Spinks, I'm the founder of uh, CMX Summit, and so we host, um, it's a pretty much a big conference for community builders and community professionals. Um, we just hosted the first one in San Francisco, and more out of just like, not a, really a plan, but just kind of because we had to, we put together the whole conference in about five weeks. Um, and really like condensed the whole process into like as quickly as possible, which was kind of crazy, but um, we learned a lot and it was actually pretty good um, when you condense everything into five weeks, all the promotion you do actually um, it creates this like surround sound effect for a lot of the people in the space. And so instead of hearing about it a little bit over three months, they heard about it a lot over a short amount of time. And so it created a lot of good energy leading into the event. Awesome. Well, I, you know, um, I, I find for, so I help uh, run the events for Social Media Club in Milwaukee here, um, and we have one advantage, which is that we meet on the second Tuesday of every single month, no matter what, and so people kind of just expect to come to the event, but sometimes, you know, if we have a speaker bail last minute, we're scrambling days before sometimes to try to, like, put the topics and get the event going, so... Um, <clears throat> So the next question is, where do you start when planning an event? So like, okay, I'm 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 new to, to event planning. Um, you know, uh, we're we're going to get something together. Like like, where should I start? Who wants to just take that? What's a good place um, to start, Eliza? Yeah. So I don't know if there's one single thing or th place where you start. I mean, a lot of things have to come into play, right? So. I mean, major things, budget, obviously, uh, venue. Venue is something you have to lock down way before anything else. Like before you have a speaker, send out invitations and all that stuff, you need to know where is this going to happen. Um, so, I mean, while there are a lot of factors, number one, venue, budget, uh, content, what is the subject matter, and then obviously reaching out to presenters. But I feel like presenters can be happening at the same time that you're locking down the other logistics of, of your event. Yeah, I agree. The really the big thing is the, the location and finding a great venue that works with you and I know we're going to talk about that later. For us, because we're a returning conference, this is our fifth year again, 
We do rely on our attendee surveys from the previous years. We're, we're also going after the same sort of audience, those who are on social media and those who are blogging, those who are in the PR world. So we really want to know um, what their needs are and want to make sure that we break down any barriers of engagement at all. And so that kind of helps us formulate where we're going to go with a theme, um, what type of speakers we want to find. And, and that sort of comes about as direct result of knowing where our community is at and where the pulse of the community is at right now. So for example, last year we did a lot of uh, social media bullying because that was a really hot topic last year. Whereas this year it may be like, what's next? What's the next social media network or the way to communicate? Is blogging, uh, is vlogging more important than blogging? And so those things kind of do form how our event's going to look like. Yeah, for me, like the very first thing is like the 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 date. Um, we don't do anything. We we're so consistent. Like I'm with Brew. Like it's the first Monday of every month, um, and different things like that. And so we always start with the date. Um, because we, I've had much better luck in New York, and um, I don't know what you guys have in terms. Of, we'll talk more about venue, but like New York City is sort of infamous for being venue hell um, <laughs> in so many ways. So um, you have to know yep. like when and like what you're expecting from a venue before they will ever ever even talk to you. So for me, um, like venue is important, but you have to have all everything else sort of like in the queue um, and like ready to go uh, logistics wise before they'll ever even really talk to you. Yeah, we're just going through the whole uh, New York City venue search now. Let it's, me know. Uh, I know. I know it from top yeah. to bottom. So. Well, you know, we, we've checked out a lot of places. We've like learned a lot about it. Um, we don't start with venue. Um, we kind of just like figure out the venue as we go. Um, we start 100% focused on speakers and content. Um, you know, so far in my experience, it all if you nail the content and you really get it to as high of a level as possible, a lot of the other things start to fall into place. So essentially what I do is I send out an email to all the people we want to be keynote speakers first, and I say, what dates work for you in like this one month time frame, and who, whichever date the most of them can do, we just choose that date and we start rolling from there. Once you get the keynotes on board, you know the rest of the speakers also want to get on board because they want to speak with those people. Um, sponsors are already interested because they see the level of people that are getting involved and it all kind of just falls into place from there. Awesome. Um, I did want to let everybody know too for everyone viewing over on Twitter we are, we always as always will take questions directly from you uh, for our guests here so um, I already see some coming in so please feel free to, to tweet us um, alright so um, you guys talked a little bit about this um, but what are some of the things you take into consideration um, when you're trying to find a venue well for us we really know our audience quite well now. We have a large group of people who are introverts, and so for us, going to a conference center doesn't work because our audience likes to be able to escape if they're getting a little overwhelmed. We have a two and a half day conference. We're with 400 women, mainly women, for a very long period of time, and so for us, we need to find a place that um, has a hotel attached to it. Also, looking for a place that ha uh, is willing to work with us because we're not. We're a conference, but we're not like the, I guess you'd say we're the anti-sham wow conference. We don't want just rows and rows of, of uh, sponsors down the halls and you know, get your bag and go. We want places where they can get to know one another, get to know the attendees, and kind of start of a relationship on a, a longer basis. And so we look for hotels who are willing to work with us. Like, for example, at the Delta Meadowvale that we're booking again at, the very first time we're booking back at the same hotel, which is fantastic. Um, they're willing to do a bat signal on the side of the hotel for us if that's what we want. And so it really works and plays well into what our sponsors want because they want to think outside the box as well. It's very important that they just don't set up and, and hand out little bags and say thank you next, thank you next. And so for us it's a it's not just the space of the hotel but or the space of the conference center, it's with a hotel and it's a hotel that also is willing to be creative with us. I think it's also really important to right-size your venue. 
Um, that was a, a good piece of feedback I got from uh, a previous community manager that I worked with where um, a lot of times you end up in a venue that's really large for your actual event and then attendees kind of look around and there's nobody, you know, they're, they're, everyone else is so far away from them. Um, so it's important to really right size. So you want to make sure you have a really great space for the event you're actually planning. So if it's a big conference, that's one thing. If it's more of a meetup, you know, you need to find the, the space that will give you everything you need if you're going to do a presentation or um, have just a kind of casual gathering. Um, and then Wi-Fi is also a huge consideration at just about every event. Um, so many places don't quite um, have the connections that they should. Um, and sometimes as an event planner, you actually have to bring in additional Wi-Fi. We've seen that um, both with uh, corporate events and then the community events that I've arranged as well. So those are also big considerations. But again, that's dependent upon your audience. Are they all going to be on their laptops taking notes, tweeting the whole time? Then you definitely want to have it. If it's more of an interactive, conversational thing, probably not that big of a priority. Well, with that Wi-Fi, if you have people coming in from another country, for example, their data packages are going to yeah. be astronomical. So even if you're no longer in the actual conference space, but you're taking people off off-site to another location, make that a consideration as well, that bring in Wi-Fi and make it accessible and put that Wi-Fi information everywhere. I don't know how many times I go to a, a place and I'm trying to find, figure out what the password is and it's nowhere. It's nowhere to be found. So it's, it's a good idea to think outside of the actual conference space if you're taking people off-site. So one of the big considerations that we have when we talk about venues is when we talk about public or private space. Um, it's actually one of the things that I feel like New York Tech Women has done really well um, because uh, we sort of pride ourselves on being like just like a non-meetup, like non-networking type of thing. And so um, when we have, for me, the, the vibe, like the actual energy and the vibe, um, the people capital, um, the, the actual like human capital inside of a space and office, um, the employees really, really matter to us um, because we've built all of our, like our content is our vibe and our energy. Um, that's what makes us really special. Like are the conversations flowing? Are you just shaking hands and moving on? Things like that. So for us, venue actually um, comes into play. We actually can't use private office space or private like space like that generally um, <clears throat> just because the vibe is all wrong. So for us, we are actually lucky. Part of my job is finding great bars. Um, <laughs> yay! I love my job. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I actually get to like do like brunch spots and and test out like what would work because um, we do some of those. And so um, we actually spend a lot of time um, like making sure the staff is really friendly. That there's not gonna we're not gonna have any issues with that. So. Yeah, I mean, speaking to, to more casual event locations, like we, a lot of times when we have a more serious conference or panel event or educational thing, uh, we sometimes like to have like a, a place for them to decompress and network and, and kind of uh, get to know the attendees each other. So thinking about is there a pub or a restaurant nearby to the conference venue that, that people could attend afterwards and, and you know, drinks on whoever is organizing the event. But it's, it's also really nice for, for attendees to make that connection with people that actually attended the event because, you know, you're building relationships in addition to whatever you're learning. So, yeah. Yeah, for um, CMX Summit, like, the biggest consideration for the venue is probably, um, again, the vibe and the experience. Um, so we really try to look for, like, a raw space that we can brand and, like, create our own kind of experience. And what, what it does when it's a raw space is when people are there, they feel like the whole space and everything is there for that event and for everybody to kind of come together. But if you do it at like an office or a conference center, it kind of feels like you're just passing through someone else's space. And it's just a different, it's a subtle difference, but I think it's really important. If you want people to feel like they're a part of something really big, uh, to Oh, I think we lost you, David. Although you you got frozen at a pretty good um, pretty good uh, shot there, so we'll, we'll we'll have to keep it here. We'll click on you so everybody can see you real fast. And all right, okay. I was gonna, uh, for real quick, I was just going to point out too, um, which didn't get mentioned, but depending on the type of meetup you're having or event that you're having, food is a huge thing when you're looking at uh, locations as well. Jen kind of mentioned that a little bit, but. 
Um, I know when we were planning unconferences, uh, we would kind of look at events based on, ven sorry, venues based on whether or not we could bring in catered food or what their catering options were, et cetera, because sometimes the space is a good price, but the catering that you're required to have there, not so much. Yeah, that's the one thing about working with a conference center or a hotel is that uh, you have a lot of uh, hoops to jump through. You've got to you got to make sure you've got your corkage covered, your forkage covered. Those are all extra add-ins that a lot of people don't expect. Um, you may, for example, go into a space and you haven't negotiated all those little finite details and then get slammed with it at the end. So you want to make sure you're very prepared. That contract is completely laid out. So you know that if they take off a door, it's going to cost you $400. Or if they put on a cling, it's going to cost you $500 to remove the residue from the cling. Those are all things that you have to negotiate before you go into a deal with a hotel. You need to know if there's any surprises. You don't want any surprises at all. And they can nickel and dime you, depending on the type of venue. Now, we did move out of downtown Toronto to a more suburban area because uh, the cost was just the F&B charges for a downtown or a big city are astronomical. So we, we did bring it to more of a, it's not the country, it's, it's half an hour from downtown, it's Mississauga, but uh, the burbs, because the cost factors were much more affordable, it was, it was making the price point for people coming as well much more affordable. Yeah, yeah I think kind of along with that too, if you're doing a smaller meetup, um, kind of think about who you know that's involved with it as well. I know our local meetup, um, we end up with free food and we just pay for drinks because one of the girls in our group does their social media, so. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, just to your point, Shannon, like I had um, <clears throat> I had a, a brunch venue space one time that, um, like I just, uh, and just watch your contracts because uh, tea and coffee had been in the contract at one point um, and something somehow it ended up getting like negated and like taken actually taken out of the contract that we missed at final sign and so we get there and um, they were trying to charge like our attendees it was like prepaid brunch like a buffet and they were trying to um, charge us for tea and coffee <laughs> of all things tea and coffee Yikes. And it, it's expensive. Tea and coffee that in itself is, it's not like, you know, you drive into McDonald's and grab a dollar coffee or Tim Hortons here in Canada. It's uh, it's on a hotel venue or a conference venue. It's astronomical. That's New York. Everything's astronomical. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, I'm going to bring in a question here from uh, Twitter. Um, Amy asks... Uh, if there's going to be some discussion of the customer of customer meetup events, no speaker, just in-person engagement, and how do you make those successful? So we do a lot of those across Canada. We do they're called we call them small tweet ups. So and we invite people throughout our community uh, to bring their friends to invite their um, their business partners or entrepreneurs and whatnot. And it's very casual. Uh, we partner with a restaurant make sure that it's not too too noisy so you can actually have a conversation. But I think it's really important that people do make those small smaller connections in a smaller venue. And uh, it, we've had great success with them. And it, it can be a short turnaround, like say, you know, in two weeks we're going to get together at such and such restaurant, um, bring your devices, make sure that they have Wi-Fi, and make sure there's food and drinks. And you don't have to have a speaker, but it's, it's you're encouraging engagement amongst the people who are joining. I yeah. Think, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. go ahead. Yeah, so I was just going to say at Hootsuite, we have a Hoot Up program, which is our equivalent of our Meetup program. Um, and then in its most basic definition, it's two uh, or three or more people talking about Hootsuite. And so have, it can literally be anyone around the world. Last year, we had 172 in over 20 different countries or 50 different countries and it's just people like it's a range of events from you know panel or just networking or uh, having a speaker or a more formal event but it's basically you know providing people of our community uh, an offline space to kind of interact and engage and and again build those relationships but it's it's also a large part empowering our users and our fans to really get to you know come around their this tool that they they all enjoy and that they all find value in, and it's not something that that is ever mandatory. But um, we just we just love seeing them having a good time and and sharing sharing the positive word of mouth um, of Hootsuite. 
Yeah, so I don't I don't actually ever have panels or speakers um, at the TechMoon events because we actually do consider like all of our community to, to be customers and we want to make sure that they're getting everything they need out of um, the time together. So many times we've actually gone to a lot of different events and you get like a, a great group of women together, a great group of people together in, an, in a space and an environment um, and they get a few minutes of networking before and then you get panel and then nobody ever actually gets to interact and so we are sort of the space to do that. and. Um, so almost all of our events are that way. Um, and, and the best thing that I can say to like make those work well is to invite um, like five really awesome people, make sure that they're coming um, and that they understand that that's your value. Um, that the, the conversation is your content. The conversation and the connections are really your content and your value um, so that you don't end up with a, a group of customers coming together like and shaking hands and changing the vibe of what you want. And so that's probably my best advice for making sure that like our smaller events um, have the energy that they're supposed to is to really reach out to five people and say like, hey, I know you've been. Can you come again? Like we're putting together a great group of people. So. Well, I think especially when you think about an online community and you're doing an event to sort of get them together offline, um, you know, you, you really want to focus on bringing in, you know, I guess, I guess for lack of a better term, the cool kids, right? Um, who, who are the people that are leading the online community that everyone loves? They're, they're going to be the ones, I think, that are going to draw everyone saying, oh my gosh, look who all is going to be there. I have to get to this offline event. Um, and uh, and so if you have a strong online community, um, I think it's I think it's actually easier to bring them offline because they want to get together, they want to shake hands, they want to give each other hugs, um, and buy each other drinks, and and you're just providing that platform to do that. Well, anytime you have an offline community engagement party or get together, you do actually increase the loyalty. So if you're looking for a customer base, for example, and you want to have um, Say you're a restaurant, you want to have something to do with your, your best people. Rather than having those loyalty cards, have a night. Appreciate them. Have them come in. Do some free appetizers with them. Talk with them. It's amazing how much more loyal a customer will be if you do take the time to make them feel important, make them feel like they're part of your, your family. And I also think if you're just getting started, I mean, great point about you know having the, the rock stars show up to an offline event. I've seen a lot of uh, offline events that have not gone so well because those those big community members that people were looking for weren't there. Um, but I also think if you're a beginning community and you don't maybe don't have those rock stars just yet, uh, for this kind of an event it's really one where venue is really key uh, because you are competing against so much other stuff. You know, even in our regular lives we've got, you know, do we want to go to the gym? Do we want to go home? Um, so it's you've got to motivate somebody to get out to your event, and if they don't have the the knowledge that they're going to meet those rock stars, do it in some place different, something special, something weird that you know. Do it in a bowling alley, you know, things that people don't traditionally uh, look to when they think of like a networking event. Um, and then as your community grows, you'll have more of those rock stars that you can rely on. But if you're just getting started, definitely take advantage of all the neat venue areas. See, my definition of a rock star is your advocate is the person who is your advocate online. You can get that person, they may not have a huge following, but they love you and they will appreciate just you, you communicating with them and then sending out to their their population and their friends and, and where they're attached to. You never know, that one person may not be the rock star, but they may have a rock star following them. And so as brand ambassadors or, or as people who are ex really ex excited about your company, your business, your, your conference, those smaller people who tend to be a little bit maybe more um, enthusiastic, definitely you know, converse with them and get them onto your team. Yeah, that's absolutely true. In fact, a lot of our hoodups are run by our brand ambassadors and you know, it's natural, it makes sense. They're already really passionate about our product. Why not uh, get in touch with people in your community and, and, and show them your passion and, and if they like it, they don't. If not, you know, they came out and had a great event and met cool people. It's a win in any way. Cool. Let's jump into our fourth question here, and then we'll take some more Twitter questions. Um, uh, and uh, I, I'm, what's the you know mo a lot of events rely on sponsorships, um, especially uh, that helps really I think lower the cost of tickets for 
uh, the attendees, and let's face it, in some cases, you know, it's helping. I mean, you're, you're doing this to also, um, you know, run your business. Um, but when it comes to sponsors, like, what what are some of the best approaches to find sponsors for your event? I think it's just ask the people you know that you're already doing business with. Um, for instance, at you know, like Sherry mentioned, you know, getting free food in an event because someone's working for a restaurant. Um, at our Net Squared events, we get a, a great deal on the food that we bring in because our main organizer, Regina, frequents this uh, bakery in her neighborhood and developed the relationship with the owner. Um, same thing for venue. A lot of times when we meet up at a venue, um, it's because we've got a relationship with someone that works there. So most of the sponsorship that uh, we've gotten through all of our meetups is people we knew, people we already had the connections with, and you know, it's just kind of T taking a look at the people that are in your group and seeing how they want to help out, a lot of times, um, you know, they've got that connection already in place, and they're happy to share it with you. We pitch a lot. Not. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, David. I'll save <laughs> you. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. So we just did the first CMX summit, and um, you know, I think for the first event, it's always going to be a little bit harder to get sponsors because you haven't done it yet, and no one's sure if it's how well it's going to go, how many people are going to show up. Um, but sponsorship is definitely one of those things that, like, if you do it well the first time, people and, and the companies get a lot of value out of it. You can keep them coming back and, and start to kind of have recurring sponsors. And so over time, it becomes easier. Um, at first, you know, we, we just did, um, we tried to do a lot of legwork for the sponsors. So, you know, if we knew that a specific sponsor wanted to reach um, these specific companies or these specific people, we would actually go and talk to those companies and those people and invite them to come join at CMX and kind of manually connect the sponsors with the people that they're looking to reach. And so we kind of just brought them as much value as possible, and they all they all got a lot out of it in the end. We find we we pitch a lot of PR firms, right? We're pitching a lot of agencies for the conference, for the larger conference, and if we don't. We find that if we actually create it in a complete pitch, like an actual design, a strategic plan, not just, hey, come to our conference, but we've laid it out as to who the, who's coming, the influence that those coming are going to bring to the conference, and what they can get out of it as far as reach goes. Uh, as a social media conference, a lot of our brands and sponsors, they want to, be, they want to have that extended reach. They want to know that, um, you know, they're they're being seen by a lot of people. And so we have to get very creative and we have to help them visualize the opportunity that they have with Listen Canada. Uh, we do have a lot of returning sponsors, like you said, the first year. It is a little more difficult because you're establishing yourself for the very first time. But if you lay it out, just like anybody in the blogging world who wants to get a pitch for a particular brand, uh, a particular review or you know, sponsored post, it's all in how you craft your pitch and how you lay yourself out and why you're going to be a, an opportunity for them that they can't miss. One of the things in, that I have that I think is probably a much different problem um, for sponsors than a lot of people have. Um, so uh, I, I read your tech women, and um, I actually am very protective of who gets um, the eyeballs of our group. Um, we're in a, in a conversation right now. We're leading a conversation um, that's very, very hot topic. Um, and so quality of sponsors or people that come to us is just about anybody right now is willing to come to a group like New York Tech Women and throw a little bit of money down and be able to both look like they're doing work um, to help women um, and to work in women in technology. So it's actually really hard, e really easy for us to get money if we thought that that's what we wanted to do. Um, because everybody sort of wants to be a part of this conversation, so it's a little bit actually of the opposite problem. Um, and so I probably turn more people away for sponsorships, um, and not necessarily turn them away, but um, if the vibe isn't right, um, then they're really just not a very good fit for us. So we've actually not taken advantage of sponsorships as nearly as much as most, or even as much as we could, um, because I would much rather remain like the quality of our of our group and integrity of those conversations more so than just the money. And you know, as much as it would be really great to make more money on things that we do, um, I just cannot possibly like just have people. Um, leveraging like a partnership with me just to say that they're doing work when they really aren't. So Absolutely. I have a very no, I, I agree. Yeah. 
No, a thousand percent. It's it's very important to us as well that that it works organically, naturally with our attendees. Uh, it can't be awkward. It can't be just random somebody who so doesn't fit with the community and with with the, the theme or the the message that we're trying to get across. Absolutely, you you can't sell yourself. You need to actually have integrity. <laughs> Yeah, so we actually um, only have sponsors um, a couple times a year. We so, do. We probably do between 40, 40. We did almost 50 events our first year. Our second year, we did quite a. We did fewer, probably closer to 20 or 25, um, and the same this year. And um, we only have very, very few sponsors. Just to add a different perspective, uh, in the role I'm in, it's, it's the opposite where it's, we're not looking to get sponsored. We'd rather a lot of people approach Hootsuite looking for sponsorship. Um, so, I mean, just in that perspective, things that I look at when I'm kind of reviewing a sponsorship application, you know, what's in it for us, obviously, what's the value prop to RS contributing to it, and how much work is it going to be for us to partner with this event? Um, is this a market that we want to be a part of or that we want to reach out to? Uh, who's attending? Are there any major prospects who are also going to be at the event? Um, so yeah, things like that is is what I don't know what a company looks for when you do approach them for for sponsorship. You know, I think from a uh, I look at sponsorship two ways. Like one, I find that it's really it's a lot easier for in kind sponsorship. When, um, you know, to be short notice, right? So if all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I need food or I need, um, you know, video or whatever, right? You can always usually work a deal on shorter notice. But um, I, I see that for the most part, you know, when people are going to spend money, they you, you have to work according to their budget. So sometimes that can't even be six months before your event. Um, it might have to be a year before your event so they can get you in the budget and then get everything approved. Um, it, that, that seems to be a lot um, easier over time um, than, than having to uh, you know, look for it on short notice. All right. Um, anybody else want to talk at, at all about sponsorship or should we roll on to the next one? We will roll on. Uh, all right. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, well, obviously anybody who's out there um, that wants to sponsor any of these lovely panelists would probably be a good place to put that. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> like, we will I, hear, sure. I hear Hootsuite is sponsoring. Yeah, I hear. No. Yeah, and Boston Canada is still looking for more sponsors. Yeah, yeah. See, it's, like we're, it's like the match game right now. We're just we're making connections happen. I just think if we're going to say it. Right. Well, uh, you know what? We're, and we'll we're being humble. We'll remember humble. to make sure to put all the contact info for your events um, on the YouTube page as well. So, um, all right. So number five is about um, how do you spread the word? Um, so you're having an event. Like, how do you how do you let people know? What are some of the techniques you use? Um, we do a lot of work with existing communities, and anybody who already has an audience that's in line with ours. So we'll you know, offer them a good discount, or we'll write content for them, or do an interview with them, or do a hangout. <laughs> but just doing anything to get in front of the right people who are in line with the audience, um, and just kind of help the existing audiences that are any way we can. It's the same for Bliston Canada as well. We have our established community, because we're in our fifth year now, but we also partner with other conference groups or other network groups that are similar to ours and aligned to ours across Canada as well as the US. So it's it we do rely on our community community to help spread the word and you know we do Twitter party announcements, blog posts, um, we have people guest posts from past conferences. Um, we have media spots on Canada AM, Marilyn Dennis, uh, local media as well as newsletters. So we make sure that we cover both traditional media and online media as well. Leveraging our community first and foremost. So again, I think I have an opposite take. Um, we actually have to close all of our events out. Um, we actually don't advertise very much with them on our site. Um, but like Brew was saying, like we they know our community is like the first Monday of every month, the first Thursday, like whatever that takes. Um, they, 
most of our community is like pretty expected to come and see that. Um, and because we have we do have a good reputation in terms of our consistency and things like that, I don't think that we actually don't advertise our events that much. Um, in fact, I probably rest on my laurels a lot more than I should. Uh, I'm generally having to ask and say, actually, I'd like two more spots um, if you want to invite somebody. Um, and we'll open it up. But generally speaking, we um, all of our events are pretty closed out. Um, so we are careful, actually, not to over-advertise. Um, most all of our work is done like internally, our website, our mailing list. And yeah, and obviously, like Twitter and Facebook, we have some really active off offline, or excuse me, online. So we don't put them out too many places. I mean, for Hootsuite, social is in our DNA. So it makes the most sense for us to be doing most of our promotion via social. Um, so whether it's, you know, engaging people with a, with a Twitter contest and the winner is announced at the event. So right, that's not only getting the word out there, but also uh, giving people another incentive to actually show up when they say they would. Um, and reaching out to your speakers and panelists, whoever it might be, telling them to spread the word to their networks, obviously. Um, every event has to have an hashtag for us. Um, so making sure that's really visible front and center, like you sh it's not something you should have to scroll down to the bottom of the page and find in a tiny little corner. Um, yeah, social social is everything for us. I'll just say on like a really small meetup level, um, I think like a year ago we started doing a meetup here in town, Shannon's been to it, uh, for local community managers because I just wanted to know who else was here. I just moved here and was looking for other community managers. And to do that, I did a LinkedIn search on community um, within this area and I did a Twitter search on community within this area and that's really how I found like the initial people to kind of kick it off with. Yeah, we met on Twitter first. It's true. <laughs> I just wanted to bring in this tweet I saw from Chris, um, and he says uh, he looks at covering both traditional and electronic media. So I think uh, that's an interesting point. Um, you know the, that sometimes we forget there's other ways. Uh, you know, from a traditional standpoint, to talk to people about your event. Um, you know, not not just completely electronic. Yeah, I think with Community Manager Appreciation Day, we are going to advertise that in social media monthly or something, some magazine, um, except for I ran out of time to put that together. <laughs> yeah, we do, a, like, I mean, it's also just about, like, being on the ground. Like, I live in San Francisco now, but we're doing a New York event, so I'm going to be, you know, it's in five weeks, so I'm actually going to New York for five weeks, and I'm just going to spend a lot of my time just meeting with people in the community and talking with them and spreading the word literally one person at a time but if you do that enough it kind of starts to spread I'm going to jump in with another question here um, this is from Carmela she says what about incentivizing others like a street team to help get sponsorship opportunities to your event kind of jumping back to that one Anybody use any street teams or something like that? No, I mean, go we ahead. Get, oh, sorry, we get a t ton of volunteers, people that are very excited to work with um, our programs. Um, but I'm pretty careful about, like, obviously go and come to our events and share the love. Um, but I'm pretty careful in terms of. Um, taking on a lot of stuff from uh, from volunteers like that um, because I would hate for something to get started and not get um, like finished up with so we're pretty I'm actually pretty careful about those kinds of things we do incentivize um, depends on depends on what happens with it it's, our community is very active in that sort of always pitching for themselves and so oftentimes they'll be pitching uh, a particular person that they want to do and then all of a sudden they'll say well hey have you heard of Bliss in Canada and they'll make that introduction and so as a thank you for that introduction and if it goes into a sale we'll definitely thank them for, for putting that together for us if it works out. Uh, I know at South by Southwest Hootsuite does have a street team but it's South by Southwest it's so crazy out there that you really have to like pull out all the works to to get someone's attention just because there's so much going on so many interesting events um, but typically, not really, and sometimes it doesn't really make sense to have a street team. Like, I mean, if you have like a medical conference, you're not really going to have a street team out there, or whatever it might be. But um, yeah. 
Cool. I'm going to bring in uh, one more question here from Twitter, um, and it's from William over at uh, Tech Stories, and he asks, any tips for getting people to turn up to an event if your community is spread out geographically? Well, there's a big geographic difference between Brooklyn and Manhattan. Um, <laughs> So uh, we're not necessarily uh, spread out geographically, aside from some very, very specific nuances of our city. Um, and that, and how do we get them all? We we, we don't, uh, aside from hold them in places where every single train goes, and that there is actually the possibility of parking um, if that had to be had to be. Um, so location is obviously the key factor for us. Um, there's a lot that goes into getting the competition here isn't just um, location. Mm -hmm. There's so much more here for that. Well, we're taking ours across the, the country, so that's a pretty big feat in order to get into different cities and and uh, do a community event. Even though we're based just outside of Toronto, it is a Canadian conference, and so we wanted to hit the smaller towns along the way, and so we're working with people in that area that are uh, alumni from our conference and they are then reaching out into their own region and, and bringing people from their communities out here. So we had one um, last year we hit Vancouver, Surrey, uh, Montreal, Ottawa and so we, we worked with somebody in the area who was willing to help us reach out to their local um, chapters of social media and bring them to the particular event. I also think it's really helpful where you can to either give a free pass to the event for people that are traveling, um, you know, hotel blocks, things like that. Anything that's going to make it easier for someone, you know, recognize that they are coming a long way. Um, you know, give them an incentive. Have special events that you know, if, especially if it is a big conference, you know, that is a, a, a you know once a year thing that people really want to get out to. Um, make it as easy as possible for them. You know, if you're a small organizer, there's probably not a ton you can do around that unless you get you know a really great sponsorship from a hotel or something like that. Um, for big conferences like Dreamforce, you know, we have a little more options and the things that we can offer. Um, but I think it's just recognizing that you know you do have a spread out community and. And, you know, ultimately ask them, you know, what can I do to make this an event that you can get to and that you won't want to miss? You know, hear their feedback. Maybe travel's not the issue. Maybe it's something else. Um, just figure out what it is that they're needing. We uh, had a conference in Madrid back in March, yeah, March, um, for Magento. And my friend actually hosted it, and it was mostly focused on Spain. It was called Meet Magento Spain, but there was kind of like a sub-community, I guess, of us that came in from other countries um, to kind of help them out, some were on the speaker team or whatever. And my role specifically was really just to organize those people coming in from other countries and make sure that they had what they needed and make sure that um, they kind of knew the schedule and had things to do since they were coming in at different times, knowing when people were arriving, when they were leaving, um, just kind of organizing that. So sometimes you have to look at that aspect as well. It's like maybe you have a smaller group traveling in from way far away, um, and in addition to most of your attendees. Yeah, back, um, I, so I ran a community for the web for a year, and so that's a big tech conference in, in Europe, and because there aren't that many tech conferences, people come in from everywhere. There's over 3,500 people that come to this event from all over Europe and all over the world, um, and that's just, you know, it speaks to, like, having something that, um, there aren't that many of them or like where it's, it's more rare to find an event like that, that will really bring out a lot of people who then it's worth it for them to fly out. Um, and we do a lot of like online content and hangouts and stuff like that beforehand to like let anybody in any geographic area kind of get involved in the community um, and that helped them kind of stay involved even though they weren't there on the ground the whole time. Cool. All right, well, thanks. Um, Sherry, what's our last question? It kind of scrolled off the screen here for me. Sorry about that. I try to keep them updated. Um, well, I know everyone here has very different conferences and very different events, very different brands, so kind of just what are the little details you put in place to make your event special, to make it um, really just represent your brand and let that shine through?
Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> well, last year we did something called, uh, in October obviously, in Canada, it can be quite iffy on, on weather. It depends on, on the year, but uh, we did a glamour camping event on the Friday night of our of our conference and so we had a, a tent outside, a big huge glamorous tent. It was crystal clear see-through with chandeliers and different wines from Ontario in the uh, tasting room as well as a uh, supplier for food. You know, white glamorous couches and so we were here in our in our beautiful ball gowns and rubber boots or you know like make everyone took advantage, full advantage of that sort of glamorous, er, glamorous um, theme. We had some people show up in the Canadian tux, which is a lumber, lumber jacket, it's our version of a tuxedo. And so we had Julie Black, who was a fantastic R&B soul artist, and she sang for us, and it, it blew the doors off the place. The entire hotel was out on the balcony watching the conference go on, and uh, it really resonated. She was blown away. She actually collapsed at the end in sort of like a I can't believe what's going on. This is absolutely fabulous. And we just had a party in the parking lot of the hotel. And you know, six months later, people are still talking about the different parties that we threw as well as the speakers that we had. Last year, we didn't, uh, we didn't shy away from any of the tough topics. We did a social etiquette panel. And we talked about conversations that no one wants to talk about. You know, We have people who are always saying that their children are being bullied, but yet they're bullying other people on social media. So we really, uh, we really left people with a really deep impression of uh, of Bliss in Canada, and that they're still talking about it six months later. So we have a lot of fun, a lot of education and takeaways, and a lot of moments um, where people can get some breathing space and and um, connect with one another. Um, yeah, I guess I think that. Uh, I, it's something similar I've been saying is that it, for us, it, it really is just all about like the inclusive nature. It's how we encourage um, people who've not been there before. It's the attitude that we have that everybody brings something to the table. Um, and I think that like our very all-inclusive nature, um, even to what is seemingly kind of on the outside, um, like an exclusive group because we do women only. Um, is probably what sets us apart. Um, I think that no matter what I hear in terms of testimonials, um, we hear things like, yeah, um, I met my best friend, um, I'm now her bridesmaid, I met her at a New York Tech Women event. Like, um, I hear conversations about, um, you know, I just didn't think that there was any chance for me, I, I just didn't know anyone, and the people that I met at our group were just really, really phenomenal, and now, like, I'm doing wonderful things, and so, um, what sets us apart is just our attitude um, towards humility. Yeah, and to, to tie off of that, I think, uh, especially at something like Dreamforce, where it's this huge, massive event, um, something to really you know, show that special touch is to give your community the, the space to connect with each other um, and you know, have that, their little spot of their own, basically, amidst everything else. Um, it shows the appreciation of we appreciate you and that you know we really value your contributions and give them the space and, and show you know special uh, thank yous in other ways maybe it's a special lunch or dinner or something like that we've done all of these things but you know sometimes it's even just a little water bottle with a little nice note inside you know it doesn't have to be anything huge and grand you know for those of you that are dealing with a small budget a handwritten note goes a long way you know, when I think about the conferences that I've been to and the things that really made, you know, me feel special, it was things like that, you know, where you really felt like uh, the people putting it on really appreciated that you were there. So it doesn't have to be all fancy, you know, expensive blowout party with, you know, some fancy DJ. You can, you can go small and still make people feel really valued and special. Yeah, absolutely. We had, uh, sorry, one of our sponsors last year, it was Hallmark, and they did um, little notes, kind of like little love notes to one another, and so you'd write a love note to, or an appreciation note to someone who you just ran into, usually it was like, in the line up for the bathroom, or line up for food, and uh, they would call you out on the Twitter wall, saying, come and pick up your card, and people were crying, I mean, it really did touch them, it really did, uh, it made newbies feel very, very wanted and very welcome, and it, it's a huge point to, to appreciate those who have come out one thing we do is uh, we send uh, like a little gift package to all of our speakers after the event as a way to just say thank you. Um, 
And it's just like a very small thing, but everyone really appreciates it, and it keeps them engaged, and it kind of wraps it up nicely. And, you know, all of our speakers love to come back now, and um, they kind of stay involved in the community. So it's just like a nice way to say thank you. Hootsuite is huge on our swag, for sure. I see Sherry is wearing a Hootsuite shirt. Good on you. Um, but yeah, so we have swag at every event, um, different swag depending on the event. So free events, we'll do like stickers and stuff. And of course, if it's an enterprise event, a little more um, high level items. But um, but yeah, Hootsuite's huge on the swag and in our culture. Uh, having a Hoot feed, so basically the Twitter stream with a hashtag of event, uh, we try to have that is in our events as well. And live streaming it and giving people who, who aren't physically able to be at the event a chance to participate and feel feel a part of it and of course following up the event with with a wrap up with pictures and and you know people having fun and just something for everyone to remember like oh yeah you know that was that was a pretty that was a pretty good event not to mention branding it as a hoot up <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> Um, another fun thing we do, I forgot about that we actually kind of stole from Big Omaha, is for every single speaker, we encourage everybody in the crowd to like get up out of their seats and give a standing ovation um, when they get on stage and when they get off. And it's kind of like manufactured excitement, but it works so well and it just creates like a really good energy in the room. Um, and the speakers just come on and they're just like shocked by it and they get really excited. So it's a good way to kind of set the tone for your entire event. Yeah, raise that energy level a little bit. That's awesome. You know, one of the things, uh, I, uh, as you were talking about kind of the Hallmark notes, um, something that a uh, little, little thing we did that I thought made a huge impact last year at Summer Brand Camp, um, Team BTC actually did love notes just on sticky notes, and we went through the hotel, and during the last session, we all snuck out, and we put um, a little love note, BTC love, on everyone's doors. So when they came back from a long day of sessions, you know, it had things like, you know, love your hair, you look fantastic, you know, just like little compliments that, um, you know, brighten up their day. And it's those sort of things, like those little tiny experiences, um, I think that, like, make people remember your event and want to come back next year. Absolutely. You never want to lose your attitude of gratitude. No matter how large you get at a conference, people are spending a lot of time, effort, and money to get to your to get to your conference and, and to be part of your community. And if it is truly a community, it's like family. And you have to appreciate them for sure. I think on, uh, one other important thing too, and I, and I think you guys all touch on this a little bit, but still remember we're community managers, right? So probably one of the most important things we can be doing at that event is connecting people. Um, and you know, making those great connections that we know, you know, we can hook people up kind of um, offline um, that are going to just strengthen relationships and everything else. So, uh, well, um, we are out of questions and we're almost out of time. Um, David, I know um, you had a, a little plug and a code um, for your upcoming conference. Would you like to share that with us? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, CMX Summit. It's a conference for community builders. Um, it's in five weeks, and if uh, you guys use the code CMGRHANGOUT20, uh, that'll get you 20% off your ticket, and uh, yeah, it'll be cool to see you guys there. Awesome, thanks. And uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully some of us can meet up uh, offline, right, um, and, and bring this topic home. So, uh, and Sherry, Blistom oh, Canada oh. is also October 2nd to 4th in Mississauga, Ontario, so BlistomCanada.com to get your tickets. Awesome. Anybody else have an upcoming event? No. Well, we if you do, we'll put them all in the uh, in in the in the belows by the comments. We have Shoot. so many. <laughs> <laughs> we have so many. Techwomen.co. There you go. I think there's still a couple tickets left in Germany if you want to join me. <laughs> oh, that'd be kind of awesome. Uh, Sherry, what do we got lined up for next week? Uh, next week is actually. I believe, shoot, why didn't I have that pulled up? Uh, <laughs> sorry, um, that's what I thought it was, building offline communities. Um, so a little different from planning events um, and the fact that it's more like, for example, co-working spaces, libraries, um, the offline communities that really inspire the work that we work to build communities online and kind of taking some tips from them. Awesome. We do still need panelists, by the way. 
So if you're watching, a good person and, I can send you. oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. <laughs> yes, please send everyone our way. Yeah, we're still right, looking for speakers as well. So. Oh, awesome. <laughs> good, good. Thanks, guys. All right, thanks everybody. Have a fantastic Friday, and Thank we'll see you next Friday, um, same time, same channel. Bye bye. 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 bye.